That said, we're talking about the Exodus tonight. Fair word of warning with the Exodus. Uh, there is a ton of stuff to cover. We're not going to even get close to covering all of it. But thankfully, we have a video from a couple years back on our YouTube where Zach goes through a lot of this stuff in a lot more detail because we have less time constraint at that time. So if you're interested in the Exodus and some of the more uh, archaeological questions, you can check out that video. All right, so before we get started with the Exodus, uh, honestly, we Christians right now need to have a serious conversation. Uh, it's approaching that time of year, in fact, every four years. Uh, to be specific, it's election season. And I know we're all uh, biting at, chopping at the bit, trying to sign that ballot already. But before I tell you who to vote for, um, <laughs> we have to have a serious conversation about what it actually means to be American. Because what makes America special is important. So if I were to ask you the question, why is America special? America is special because fill in the blank. What would you say? What would your answers be? Give me some, some words, some phrases, some ideas. Democracy. Democracy. Yeah, good one. Did you say? Geography. Yes. Big. Big country. A yes. <laughs> Texas A&M. Flag. Flag. America. Yeah. What else? Freedom. Freedom. Yes. Yeah, that was the first one I had. Freedom, right? That's what... That's what we're all about, right? The land of the free, home of the brave. What about being anti-authoritarian? You know, don't tread on me. No one can tell me what to do. Uh, same thing with individualism, right? We love the sovereign individual, the person always, you know, trekking forth, showing how they're in charge of their own lives. Um, then we have progressivism, not in a political sense, but in the sense that, you know, America is kind of the guiding light to the world, uh, progressing towards some great millennial future. Or what about the fact that some people think America is a chosen nation? Maybe chosen by God in some ways? Maybe, maybe not. But you see, these are kind of, uh, all these ideas are something that people define America by. A lot of, if you heard, listen to a political speech, they'll be referring to these ideas, right, as a kind of in the background of their whole entire speech. But I want to propose a slight thought experiment here. So, uh, Imagine that our good friend by the name of Bart Ehrman, who is a New Testament critical scholar, imagine he has a change of vocation, and he decides to be, uh, instead of a New Testament scholar, a scholar of American history. And what Bart does is Bart applies the tools of the historical critical method to the documents of the American Revolution. And Bart Ehrman finds out, he discovers, that beyond a reasonable doubt, the American Revolution did not happen. It was a myth. The myth was spread by FDR, and what really happened was America was formed peacefully over a thousand years by uh, peaceful migrations of indigenous peoples. So American Revolution is fake. What does that do to these American identifiers we just discussed in the previous slide? What gives? Can we still say uh, America is unique? What happens to the way America defines themselves? Do you have any thoughts on this? What happens? Nothing? America is still America without the revolution? OK. Interesting answer. Any, any, any other differing opinions? Alex? America <laughs> immediately disintegrates. Thanos infinity snaps, and America crumbles. Yeah, David. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Good point. So what you're saying is this kind of origin story of America is inspiring these values. And this is really clear, because where do we get this freedom, right? Patrick Henry, give me liberty, give me death, right? That's the kind of how we interpret what the revolution meant. Same thing with this anti-authoritarianism. We beat the Brits. We're the small, scrappy underdogs, right? We came in, we killed these big, bad redcoats. Uh, same thing with individualism. We have the Declaration of Independence, this language of 
uh, everyone has the right to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, et cetera, et cetera. Same thing with progressivism, democracy, and this idea of being a chosen nation, right? That democracy is the morally best form of government, and America is going to be the new light that spreads it to all the world. So all these ideas are rooted in the American Revolution. And so if we ask why is America special, the answer has to have something to do with how we interpret what the American Revolution, the historical event, meant for us. And so I don't think that if somehow the American Revolution didn't happen, I think this would have devastating effects for what it means to be an American. Because we can no longer hold true to these ideas as grounded in something real. So the American Revolution is so foundational that if it didn't happen, it would decimate the American identity. Because it's defined our cultural identity. So nope and nope. Everything goes away. In light of these considerations, I think we can say that the American Revolution functions, like Caleb said, as a type of myth for our culture. It's a myth. But before anyone has a panic attack, I'm using the term myth in a very specific way. I don't mean something where a myth is a story that involves Greek gods or fairies. What I mean to say is a myth is a foundational story for a culture, and it shapes how that culture views the world. And so myths can be true or false. Uh, they can be something that really happened or something that's fake. But for the sake of my presentation, a myth is going to answer three questions. Who are we? Where are we from? Where are we going? And I hope you can see how the American Revolution, it kind of answers these questions for America. And it defines who we think we are, what we've done, and also what we're going to do in the future. And if a myth, the foundational piece of a culture, if it's actually not true, that's kind of a big deal because myths are so important in defining cultural identity. Myths define cultural identity. That's the key thing I want you to take away. So tonight, as we go into this, we're discussing the Exodus. Um, and as Zach, Zach said, we're going to utilize our standard two-pronged approach, right? How important is the Exodus to the Christian faith? Um, if the critical scholars are right, and many critical scholars don't think the Exodus happened, they think it's made up. And so we start going to say, if the critical scholars are right, what does that do to what it means to be a uh, Christian? Um, we're also going to then go into our apologetic. If they're right, where do we go from here? And if they're not right, well, why are they wrong? So that's a little bit of our outline for tonight. Um, also, uh, if, as we, we're going to go through the triage, consensus, and apologetic. And if you get lost, you can see uh, this little thing in the corner to know where we are. So we're going to start with, well, what is the Exodus story? Uh, in case you haven't watched The Prince of Egypt in a while, it's a good to do a little quick refresher. Um, the Exodus can be pretty succinctly summarized uh, by a statement in Deuteronomy called, sometimes called the Deuteron Deuteronomic Creed. And the Israelites would say this when they came and presented God uh, their first fruits of the harvest. And so it would be a way of kind of praising God, a liturgy, if you will. And so it goes something like this. A wandering Aramean was my father, and he went down into Egypt and sojourned there, few in number, and there he became a nation, great, mighty, and populous. And the Egyptians treated us harshly, and they humiliated us and laid us on hard labor. Then we cried to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm, with great deeds of terror, with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So the basic storyline of Exodus is like this. We were slaves, and then God saved us. We were slaves in Egypt, and then God used his mighty hand to bring us out. So it's this two-step process of slaves and then freedom. And right now, I really want to emphasize that the Exodus isn't just a story that's told in the book of Exodus in the first couple chapters. It's not just confined to this one place. The Exodus is a story that's told throughout the Hebrew Bible. It's repeated over and over again um, in multiple places, and this instance in Deuteronomy is a good uh, example of that. It's rehearsed over and over again. So now, I want us to take this paradigm of cultural myth that I just talked about with the American Revolution 
and I want us to map it on to the Exodus. So the Exodus and the American Revolution, they serve almost these parallel purposes in their respective cultures. Uh, they function in very similar ways. So they're both these kind of cultural myths. They're the cornerstone, they're the foundation of their culture's identity. Uh, in fact, one scholar of the Exodus, he sums up the similarity pretty well. He says, the Exodus is the story of the birth of a nation. And the Exodus answers three big questions for Israel as a people. Who are we? Who is our God? And where are we going? And so to really understand how important this was, we have to look how the Exodus answered three, these three questions for the nation of Israel. And this is going to be, the next couple slides, a lot of Bible in a short amount of time. So, but hang on tight. It's pretty intuitive, and I think we kind of know this, but it's good for just for a little refresher. The first two questions, who are we and who is our God, are very intertwined and interrelated. And the best place to start when discussing this is Exodus chapter 6. And this uh, event occurs during the narrative portion of the Exodus. It occurs after... God's given Moses his job to go and free the Israelites. And Moses is in Egypt, but things aren't going so well. Uh, the first time he tries to tell Pharaoh, you know, let my people go. And they actually make the Israelites work harder. So Moses is pretty discouraged. He's upset. And this is what God says to him after this. He says, say, therefore, to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Can y'all see the progression of thought in this passage? Right? In some ways, the logic is a little bit circular. So we ask the question, okay, who are we? Well, yeah, uh, we are God's people. He's telling us, I will take you to be my people. And then we say, well, how do we know this? Well, because God has redeemed us. And then we say, well, who is our God? Uh, our God is Yahweh, who has redeemed us and brought us out from slavery. And so you see the identity of God, who God is and who Israel is, is tied up here in the Exodus and this act of God's historical redemption. So Exodus 6 is a key text for what it means to be an Israelite. Any questions here? This, make, this kind of makes sense, tracking? But again, as I said, the narrative portion, the story, isn't the only place we read about the Exodus. Um, it's also an event which underpins the entirety of the Torah, the legal codes in the Torah, the covenant. And so we'll be talking about the Mosaic covenant later on in this semester, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of? Okay. Uh, but the important thing to know about the covenant right now is this is kind of a big differentiating factor between Israel and the rest of the other nations. And so the covenant was kind of a boundary mark that defined who Israel was and who the other people weren't. They were set apart because they had God's law, right? But notice what the underpinning is, the reason for the covenant. Uh, right before God gave the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, he says, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And then he says, You shall have no other gods before me, right? So this is the historical fact which all the rest of the law follows from. All right, this comes first. The same things there uh, for the mandate for Israelite holiness in Leviticus, uh, in Leviticus 20. He says, or look at 11, sorry. For I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. So the fact of the Exodus and God redeeming his people gives the reasoning for why they're to be set apart and why they're to be holy. So the Exodus is also the bedrock for the legal codes, the covenant for Israel. Any questions here? Cool. Also, the Exodus features prominently in a Hebrew worship literature. Uh, the first place we really see this is in Exodus 15, right after they cross over the Red Sea. And it's a, passage, it's a song of victory, and it's called the Song of the Sea. And this is a, uh, a thing to be worshipped with the Israelites in community. And it's also, the same kind of thing is going on in the Psalms. A uh, really good example of this is Psalms 135. The psalmist says, For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above gods. He it was who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and of beast, who in your midst, O Egypt, sent signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants, who 
who struck down many nations and killed mighty kings. So again, the logic of the psalm is this, right? Our God is great. He's powerful over all gods. How do we know this? Well, because the Exodus. Uh, and this kind of thing is found all throughout the Psalms, uh, even in the next Psalm, Psalm 136, same kind of thing. And these Psalms are something, right? The purpose of them is for community worship, right? And so the nation of Israel is going to be repeating these things to themselves. As you grow up, you hear these Psalms, you worship with these, and it shapes you. It kind of defines who you are as a people. So it's a very uh, functional, functional part of it. Any questions on Psalms? So yeah, this is, it's pretty intuitive, right? So you, you see how what they're telling themselves are defining who they are as a people and what they're saying about God. The Exodus is at the core. But also, those are the first two questions. The last question is, where are we going? What's our expectation of the future? And the Exodus also played a role in thinking about what the future would look like for the Israelites. And a great example of this is found in Ezekiel 20. Um, it says, as I live, declares the Lord, surely with a mighty hand and outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, I will be king over you. I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you are scattered with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples and there I will enter into judgment with you face to face. As I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness in the land of Egypt, so I will enter into judgment with you, declares the Lord God. So I don't know how familiar you are with the book of Ezekiel, but God's kind of angry in Ezekiel. He's kind of pouring out his, his wrath and judgment on his nation, right? Because they, they went after the idols and they didn't, didn't, didn't follow the, the, the covenant, essentially. And but at the same time, he's promising restoration to the people. After captivity, there'll be restoration. And notice how this is couched here. Notice how similar the language is to the language we found in Exodus 6, right? With a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, with wrath poured out, with judgment in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. So very clearly, it's a reference to this Exodus language. And in fact, any time in the Hebrew Bible when you had the language outstretched arm, mighty hand, your mind should go straight to Exodus because it's probably an implied, implicit reference. The thought, the logical progression is, because God saved us then in Egypt, he'll save us now through Babylon and through Persia. Because, because God redeemed us then, he'll redeem us now. And this same, this same line of thought also helps formulate early expectations of a Messiah, right? This kind of a little bit of a second Moses figure, some might say. And so the Exodus wasn't just some event that happened in the past that we learned about, they learned about in history. It was an event which happened that had implications in the here and now for their future. The Exodus was an event that shaped the future, which is kind of weird to think about, right? It wasn't just confined to the past. Any questions here? So you can see how the Israelite identity is completely intertwined in the idea of Exodus. All three of the questions have something to do with what God did in Egypt, right? Who are we? We're the people God's redeemed. Who's our God? Well, he's the guy that redeemed us. And where are we going? Well, God's going to redeem us like he did in the past, even though currently we're in exile and slavery in Babylon, Persia, et cetera. So it all points to Exodus. It's inextricably tied. You can't get rid of the Exodus here. But what if you did? What if the Exodus didn't happen, as some scholars would say? Like, what gives? How would this pan out for Israel? What do y'all think? Can you get, get rid of it easily? You can't, right? The situation, I think, plays out very similarly to what happens with the American Revolution. You can't just get rid of the Exodus without getting rid of these kind of Israel identifiers, right? Because if God didn't really save Israel by bringing them out, he didn't really elect them. So this whole concept of God being supreme of, of the other gods, of God electing Israel, of this covenant, of thinking about the future in terms of what God's going to do, this doesn't make sense because God never really, in the first place, saved Israel to begin with. So everything built on that, you kind of got to throw it out. And I don't think you can say, oh, yeah, well, the Exodus can be some kind of metaphor. Because metaphors really only make sense if they have some concrete, specific reference, right? You can't just have a metaphor and have an imaginary story. That really doesn't work. 
the whole purpose is, yeah, the Exodus is a metaphor. It functions as that in a lot of the text we've just read. But it's a metaphor that's grounded in something that God really did for Israel in the past. Any questions on this? So, yeah, the Exodus is pretty important, right? Well, you can say, well, that's just for Israel. Right? We're all Christians here, right? Like, that was then. We don't, we don't need that. Like, I mean, Paul even says, like, we don't have to care about the Exodus. Uh, that whether or not the Exodus happened shouldn't matter for my faith. And so this is kind of a complicated and nuanced question. And so on one level, you'd be right to think that, okay, yeah, the Christian hope doesn't stand or fall on the Exodus, right? Because Paul does say, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Paul doesn't say, if Moses did not part the Red Sea, your faith is in vain, right? So the Christian hope stands or falls on the resurrection, not on the exodus. But the, the resurrection and the exodus are kind of occupying these parallel spots in the culture of each group, right? So yeah, we could say at some level, it doesn't matter for Christians, a little bit. But there's a pretty big caveat. Paul's comments in 1 Corinthians 15, they're not licensed to throw out the whole, New Testament, the whole Old Testament. You can't just unhitch the Old Testament from the New without some pretty uh, serious consequences. For one, the Exodus uh, is really important for how the New Testament views itself. So in, at least in the writings of Paul, the Jewish concepts of covenant, exile, and Exodus, excuse me, they were the driving forces behind what Paul was saying. If you read N.T. Wright, he brings this out all the time. Paul, at, at his core, he was a second temple Jew. So he thought about things in this Jewish way. And so he translated a lot of that thinking to Christianity and to Christ. And so if you remove the Exodus from history, you're kind of stripping the meat off a lot of what Paul is actually saying. And then you'd be kind of stripping away a lot of the meanings of Messiah and covenant and exile, which are pretty big themes in the New Testament. At the same time, uh, the Synoptic Gospels paint Jesus as operating within this kind of understanding of the Israelite exile deliverance uh, framework. Uh, this is evident in a couple times when Jesus quotes the Old Testament, Psalm 110 about Messiahs and Daniel 7, but especially in Matthew 2.15, which this citation occurs uh, when Joseph and Mary and Jesus are going to Egypt, fleeing Herod. And uh, Matthew quotes Hosea and says, this was to fill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. So we have this kind of interpretation of Jesus in the framework of Exodus. So if you're stripping away Exodus, you're kind of going to lose a lot. You can't just remove it all and say, everything is going to stay the same, it's going to be great, it will still hold up. Uh, it's pretty important for the theology of Christians. And yeah, well, if the Exodus didn't happen, we could probably salvage some belief in Christ but a lot of things would be lost. So, brief recap of what we learned so far. Exodus is an origin myth. It defines the identity of Israel, what they thought they were, who they thought they were, what they thought would happen in the future. It also undergirds early Christian theological categories. So, Exodus is pretty important, right? Any, any disagree with me? I feel like that point is pretty uncontroversial. Uh, you probably didn't need to come to this talk to hear that Exodus is important. But, okay, now, that's the first part, that's triage. What do the scholars say? So given the relative importance of the Exodus, what can we say about its historicity? If it's so important, we've got to have something to back it up, right? Unfortunately, we have almost nothing. We can say very little about the historicity of the Exodus. Um, Ansbury says that we must recognize that the direct historical evidence for the Exodus does not exist and that the precise historical minutiae of the event will most likely not materialize in our lifetimes. So no direct archeological evidence exists for the Exodus. He later says the silence is deafening. There's not a lot to go off of. Any, any thoughts here? What do we do with this? What do y'all think? 
how do we sit with this tension? If Exodus is so important to Jews, to Christians, but we don't have any evidence, well, that's kind of a problem, right? What do we do? Yeah. Well, I mean, we don't have a lot of evidence for stuff from around the time that the Exodus was supposed to happen, so I don't think that necessarily qualifies True. the Exodus as not happening. That's the point. We can get to that. Yeah? Yeah, so what happened after the Exodus? The Canaanite conquest, right? A lot of the problem is there's not a lot of evidence for the Canaanite conquest either. So, yeah, the, both questions are kind of tied up in each other. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's complicated. Yeah, t back, actually, r first up here, sorry. Good question. We'll get to that in a minute. Also, why would Jesus edition record their story? Like, what, that's how you do it. Yeah. Do it, show me who thought he was God, would not want to admit that he was a Jew that God. Yeah, so they wouldn't have written anything, probably. But would there be other, other ways of evidence? Like what? Like, possibly the evidence of three million Jews going across the Sinai Peninsula? Okay. Maybe. Not their footprints. Uh, so we'll get. Well, actually, we'll get into this later because I I want to slow down too right now. But some of you may be thinking, well, yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So that is a very interesting question about. Like, well, what does faith actually mean for Christians? Does it mean we're believing things in spite of evidence? Uh, I would certainly hope not. That's not really how Paul saw things and defined faith, as, as in my opinion. So that, that's a good question to discuss afterwards in the afterthought, though. Get, get, thanks for bringing that up. But you may be thinking, well, what about this? We discovered chariot wheels on the floor of the Red Sea, right? Right? Yeah. Have you all heard this before? No. No? Good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> This, this was a claim made by a guy named Ron Wyatt in 1993, and it's completely made up. But somehow, it still keeps getting repeated. Um, and like, not even the most pseudo-archaeology groups will believe this claim. Like, it's so ludicrous. But conservative evangelicals, unfortunately, will still pass it around because it sounds good, right? It sounds like, wow, that's like a silver bullet proof for the Exodus. So, great. No, it's not. And so... Repeating things like this actually really harms the Christian witness because if we're spouting n nonsense like this, it harms our credibility. It harms our ability to talk to people that are skeptical. Um, and so, yeah, some people claim they have evidence for the Exodus. Um, it's usually not as like, bad as this or like silver bullet as this, but a lot of them are kind of this bad. So... Uh, if you hear anyone ever talking about, you know, silver bullet evidence for whether it be God or the Exodus or anything in the Old Testament, you should probably think pretty critically about it because there's a good chance it might not be the most true. Okay. <laughs> yeah, people have found the Ark of the Covenant like 14 times already. Um, <laughs> okay, so let's go back to, yeah, don't do that. Don't, don't, don't do this. Um, go back to the consensus. When we say there is no direct archaeological evidence, well, what does that mean exactly? Well, for one, it means there is no chariots wheels on the Red Sea floor. It also means there's no secret tablets that say Moses and the Israelites left Egypt in 1446 BC. We don't have that. But the real kicker here, the real moment of tension, is that there is no evidence whatsoever for any mass migration of people across uh, Egypt uh, into the Sinai Peninsula and into Canaan. There's not a shred of evidence for that. And mass migrations like that always leave evidence. Um, so I'll, I'll put this mildly. There are, there are, according to the Bible, roughly four million Israelites going across in this exodus in a desert of the wilderness. If four million people were traveling like this, uh, that area would be a lot more fertile today than it is because of the, y'all catch my drift here? 
Um, yeah, so we would have something like what? Biological. Biological roommates, exactly. Um, and so we. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 a whole giant thing. We have this giant mass of people. You would have something, right? Like this this thing doesn't just disappear. Four million people just don't go into space and nowhere, right? So this is a problem. And if the exodus is so important, why don't we have any record of it, right? So did it even happen? And so this is the problem. This is what we Christians have to address. So into our apologetic, our third, mo uh, third part of my argument. So I just said, uh, actually, I didn't just say this, but I'll say it right here. Uh, what this, the consensus means of scholars is that if we didn't have the Bible, no one would ever dream up the Exodus. It's not a conclusion you would come to just by looking at the data. You would have no idea about any claims to Exodus unless you had the Bible. But we do have the Bible. So that's got to count for something, right? Where does it? It's actually uh, a pretty important question. It's a question of how should we evaluate the witness of the Bible? Does the Bible have any intrinsic historical value? And there are basically two perspectives, two schools of thought to answering this question. The first school of thought is what is called minimalism. Uh, and when you think minimalism, think guilty until proven innocent. Think guilty until proven innocent. Um, it works using the principle of verification. And minimalism contends that, on the whole, the Bible does not have any, specifically the Old Testament, does not have any historical value. And we should regard it as untrue and false until we have absolute certain evidence to the contrary, that it's true. So one scholar describes it in this way. The historical books, the Torah, they contain made up stories that may have exploited some vague ancient legends through which the local organized refugee population provided itself with a mythic cover history that linked it to the land and to a religion. A lot of jargon there, but what it's saying is that the Bible, these narratives in Exodus and the Old Testament, they're constructed with these political and theological motivations. And they're not concerned with writing accurate history. They're just concerned with hearing a story and kind of using it to their own advantage and gain. And it's not actually intended to be a historical document. And so, of course, on the minimalist view, that if you say, OK, well, if the Bible can't be used as a source, uh, and we, we count sources of the Bible as guilty until proven innocent, well, yeah, we can't provide evidence for the Exodus. So on this view, obviously, the Bible must be guilty. The exodus did not happen. And this is the view that a lot of scholars take. Any questions on minimalism? Yeah. Yes. They were there the whole time. That's the, other theory. That's, the, that's the other main theory, that they were just there the whole time. Um, and so answering this question, we'll get into a lot of um, conversation about Old Testament composition history. And so there's a variety of reasons why they think this kind of thing happened with the local refugee populations. We don't have time to even skin the surface of this. Uh, but it is a conversation that's out there. Jet. That's a great question, Jet. We'll talk about it. <laughs> so this is, a min this is minimalism, right? This is the view that says, yeah, the Exodus probably did not happen. And this is a view held by a lot of scholars, albeit probably not in all to the varying degrees of extremeness. The opposite view is what's called maximalism. And this is innocent until proven guilty. So it's the principle of falsification, right? Uh, it says, yeah, well, unless you can prove the Bible wrong, it's probably right. Um, and so Ansbury says that, yeah, maximalists believe that the biblical text serves as a reliable historical source and that the events it reports can be corroborated by external findings. 
so exactly the opposite, right? So it does have some kind of intrinsic historical value. It's trying to portray historical events. Um, and so yeah, we should use it as a valid source. So on this view, we should believe the Exodus because the Bible is reporting it. And even though we don't have archaeological evidence that proves it, well, it's not proving it wrong either. So on this view, we probably should lean towards accepting the Exodus. OK, well, we have these kind of an intractable problem, right? Because now we have two schools of thought approaching the problem in two completely different ways. So which way do we approach the problem? So the question is like, well, what's, how should we view the Bible? How much weight should we assign the Bible in questions of history? And framing the question in this way is how should we approach the Bible? It's actually a little bit misleading. Because the Bible is the Bible. There's all sorts of baggage attached to what that means and what the Bible should look like and how it should work. I think a better question, a better way to frame this is how do we approach ancient text in general, right? Because the Bible is an ancient text, so we should evaluate the Bible like we would any other ancient text. Um, and so we should ask, OK, well, how if we found an Assyrian source that was uh, attesting to some kind of war, how would we view it? And actually, this only pushes the problem back one step farther, because this is still a debate among minimalist and maximalist, not just about the Bible, but about all ancient text. How much value of history should we assign to uh, text of Assyrians or Babylonians, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a guy named William Hollow. Uh, so he was a professor of Assyriology and Babylonian literature at Yale. So not Bible stuff. Uh, but he was super smart, really, really great scholar. And he, the way he thinks about this question is we should treat the ancient sources critically, but without condescension. So treat the ancient sources critically, but without condescension. So what does that mean? Yeah, exactly. So it means we approach the text not with full-blown doubt, but also not with full-blown acceptance. We approach the text and say, OK, I'm going to trust that it's true, but I'm going to investigate it and make sure that it tracks with other things and that it's making sense and evaluate it critically. They're not just going to unquestioningly accept it. So it's not the same thing as like this outright literalism right? or kind of uh, just taking the Bible at whatever it says absolutely the way it says it on faith. That's not what maximal, That's not what this kind of responsible maximalist view is. And I think this is a good view to take because the minimalism to its extreme doesn't really make any sense. Uh, for one, um, archaeology is a huge quagmire. And you're not, like, you're never going to find anything that outright proves anything in archaeology, right? Usually it's paired with some kind of literary evidence. Um, and if we follow this approach to its conclusion, we would have a really hard time establishing that anything ever happened in the ancient world. So I think this, the minimalist view is kind of way too extreme to take. So I think this maximalism, uh, as expressed here, is the most robust way to view the biblical text. OK, so you can say, OK, maximalism is probably the way to go. Can we be justified in this? What do we think now? Because this still only pushes the problem one step back. We haven't actually got to the Exodus is probable. So we'll go back to America. Um, think back to the beginning, my thought experiment about American Revolution being fake. That is a completely ludicrous thought experiment. It doesn't make any sense. Why? Why is the idea that the American Revolution would be fake so completely like off the wall? True, man. Ah, true. Well, for one, yeah. Well, for one, yeah, we have a ton of archaeology for the American Revolution. But even without that, it would still be kind of insane to doubt the American Revolution. Like, yeah. Raise your hand if you believe in the American Revolution because you personally have investigated this archaeologically. That was my next point, Zach. Thank you for so stealing sorry. it. Um, I'm so sorry. Yeah, who has been to... American Revolution battlefield. Okay, 
three of you. <laughs> How many of you were that was the first time you heard about the American Revolution? None of y'all. Yeah. So, yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Zach. I'm going to shine this in your eye. Um, but yeah, for me, the way I learned about the American Revolution was my mom read me a book by Lynn Cheney, who, that's Dick Cheney's wife, and it was, it was like the ABCs of the American Revolution. So, like, that's the way I was coming into contact with it. It wasn't through archaeology. It was through my mom reading me a story. And that's probably how the most of us come into contact with what the revolution was. Um, and the point here is that we had this thing in America called cultural memory. And a scholar named, yeah, what's up? So what is the American true, true. What if? <laughs> We're going to have to speed up here. But so the point here is that as Americans, we have this kind of cultural memory of what the American Revolution was. So a scholar named Ronald Hendel, who's a scholar of uh, the Hebrew Bible, frames it in this way. It's this kind of mix of truth, fiction, details, folklore motifs, uh, ethnic self-fashioning, a bunch of jargon. Uh, but what Hendel is saying here is that uh, as a nation, we have these practices that enshrine what we remember as a group. So just as individuals think about things and remember things, so do groups also remember things. Uh, and so, yeah, well, you could quibble over the interpretation of what Lynn Cheney said in her book is like, OK, was the American Revolution really the way she portrayed it? Probably not. But there's still an underlying event there, right? So we had this cultural memory of the American Revolution. Yeah. Well, yeah, good point, because, uh, good question. Because if, the, if your identity is founded on these events happened, and it turned out they didn't happen, well, you have no right to claim those identifiers, right? So uh, if your politician says, Donald Trump says, uh, bad example, but, uh, <laughs> but he goes on a stage and says, America's about freedom, so that's why I'm going to enact this policy, right? Well, why is America about freedom? If you keep asking down and down, you say, well, because we are founded on principles of freedom. But if we really weren't founded on principles of freedom, you can't make the claim, well, we're all about freedom, because you're really not. Why not? Because if we, so if we were founded, if we were not founded on the principles of freedom, we still have the Constitution, the Bill of Rights of every single person. That's part of the American Revolution. It's fake. It was fake by, fake by FDR. <laughs> <laughs> Everything up to FDR was fake. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. You know, everything that's baked into the idea of the revolution. So I'm going to have to cut it on the comments, sorry, because we're getting short on time, and we have a lot more to go through. But look, okay, let's bring it back to Exodus, as Caleb just did, right? Remember, the Exodus is not just a story in the book of Exodus. It's referred to throughout all the Old Testament uh, in multiple places in multiple different literary styles. And so this Old Testament is a document that spans hundreds of years in the process of composition. So you have, yeah, the cultural memory of the Hebrew people uh, throughout song, through multiple years, uh, even texts like Song of the Sea, which date as early, some scholars, back to the 12th century BCE, so very old. Uh, you have Israelites repeating this idea to themselves for a very, very long time. Yeah, 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 exactly. The cultural practices included what? The Passover, right? What you said to yourselves, we're reenacting what God did for us in Exodus. In yes, true. So the point here is that it would be really weird if we had all these references to this event that happened and all this celebration and all this thinking and reflection about it. It would be really weird if it didn't actually happen, right? 
Does that sit right with y'all? If you have all these references and then, oh yeah, it didn't happen. Doesn't really make sense, Katie. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. That's that's the entire point, right? You hit the nail on the head there. So what this means is that we have pretty strong reasons for thinking that there's some type of historical exodus that happened in the past, right? Pretty solid reasoning to thinking that, because it's so well attested in the sources. So. I think we can establish that on the basis of this cultural memory, there was probably some real event of the Exodus. Does this make sense to everyone? Are we tracking here? Um, but can we go further? Because this gets us to an Exodus. It doesn't get us to the Exodus the way it's described in the book of Exodus. Because some of the earliest texts, uh, like in Deuteronomy, they're not very specific. They just kind of say, we're slaves and God redeemed us. Is there anything else we can say that would bring credence to the Exodus as expressed in the book of Exodus. Um, so let's examine some circumstantial evidence. But first, objection. This is the biggest, as I said before, the biggest objection to the Exodus is the fact that what's with all those Israelites? The numbers seem really improbable. So the, the key text here is Numbers chapter 1, verse 45, when it says, uh, they count the people and every man able to go to war was 603,550. That's fighting age men. So if we extrapolate, include women, children, old people, we're getting to about three to four million Israelites. So a lot of them. Uh, one guy, one critic of the Exodus in a long time ago in the Enlightenment, he did a little thought experiment where he said, okay, let's imagine the Israelites, they walked in a line that started with six people, and then we have six people in the front, and then behind them and behind them and behind them, this long line of Israelites. What happens is that line, by the time the first people in the line reached Canaan, the last people would still be in Egypt. So these numbers are very improbable. At the same time, right, the geographic area isn't that big. And Egypt, the max population was around 1 million in ancient times. So yeah, where, where are these 3 to 4 million Israelites coming in, right? It doesn't track. It doesn't make logistical sense. And so we can say, well, is the Exodus as described in like uh, Exodus numbers, is that even physically possible? And so what's the deal here? Is the Bible lying? Is it just plain wrong? Well, it turns out it's kind of a complicated problem. It involves uh, the Hebrew word elep. Um, did I get the translation right? Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, so the word elep typically is translated as 1,000, right? So we have... Uh, 600,000 Israelites. But it's not always translated in this way. Um, there are times when it makes more sense to think about it as something else. A good example of this occurs in Judges chapter 6. This is the story of Gideon. And God comes to Gideon. He says, you're going to save Israel. But Gideon's hiding, threshing his wheat. And he says, no, I'm not. Like, what are you talking about? He says, uh, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan, which literally means my thousand, is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Now, is Gideon really saying, my thousand is the weakest in Israel? He's referring to exactly a thousand people and saying, they're the weakest in Israel. Does that make any sense? Or does it make more sense to say, yeah, Alep there is functioning as a stand-in for kind of a clan. It also makes more sense in Judges with the parallelism in the next line, I am the least in my father's house. So where clan, thousand, and house are kind of parallel to each other. Also, in some instances in 1 Samuel, it works as a military unit. So one scholar, James Hoffmeyer, says, yeah, what this verse in Numbers really means is 600 units of 3,500 warriors, which that's a lot less than 3 to 4 million. Or you could just punt the question and say, actually, 
we don't understand a lot of Bible numbers. So we probably should conclude here, there's something going on here that we don't understand. And so we shouldn't adhere to this literalistic date of 600,000 when we really don't know what's going on in the mind of the authors. That's what I would do. I'm kind of non-committal like that. OK, so that's the biggest objection. Any questions? Yeah, Jet. Well, uh, yeah, it's a pretty solid estimate because wh what they're doing is like you can get a good I feel for how big the cities were. And if your cities, there's a big difference between a city that can accommodate like 100,000 people and a city that can accommodate millions of people. So we have pretty good evidence to indicate that, yeah. Um, well, yeah, it's a complicated question. It involves how Jesus interpreted the Old Testament. Um, and yeah, so Jesus quoting would mean that he believes in its truth, right? In, 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 um, in some fashion. It doesn't mean that our interpretation of Old Testament is true. Because we really don't know how Jesus interpreted every single verse of the Old Testament, right? Um, and so, well, that's a good point. It doesn't really work in this instance. Because we're still having to deal with, okay, well, what did Jesus think about it? Yeah. Okay, so for the last slide, like in numbers, whenever it was saying like 600,000, wouldn't like this knowledge of the possible, yeah, 603, 550. Yeah. So wouldn't that be translated differently with the knowledge on the next slide of how so yeah, ESV renders uh, the verse in Judges as clan, but in the vast majority of instances, it's still rendered as thousand in other places in the text. So uh, generally, Elip does mean thousand, but there are instances where it kind of makes no sense to read it as one thousand literally. Okay, but most say that big number, right? Most well, all translations say this big number. Uh, I'm not aware of anyone that doesn't. Oh, okay. But um, also, I don't know any translations in Judges that will render mostly as thousand. Most render as clan, I'm pretty sure. Okay. So. Is, uh, the kind of the this, what verse? That's, that's how Hoffmeyer translates this. Okay. Yeah. Importantly, all of those translations include a footnote that's like, here are alternate translations yeah. of this. So okay. In the interest of time, we got like. Yeah, yeah. So there's, this is the big objection. We can, there's uncertainty here. There's other two lines of evidence that are actually really important in this discussion. The first is that Semitic groups or people that were from the region of Canaan or the Middle East, we have evidence that's very clear, very rock solid, that these people were slaves in Egypt. That doesn't mean Israelites, but it means people of kind of the same ethnicity were slaves in Egypt. Um, because interestingly, Egypt, from the time period of about 1400 to 1100, they were ruling Canaan. Canaan was a province of Egypt. And so they would go and get slaves in Canaan, Egyptians would, for a variety of reasons. Um, tributes, prisoners of war, mass deportations. At the same time, we have a ton of slaves there, right? At the same time, we also have evidence that some slaves escaped. Ronald Hendel, a scholar I cited earlier, cites a letter uh, which note, uh, it basically gives the account of an Egyptian slaver chasing some slaves that go into the wilderness. So I don't think it's very implausible to say that, yeah, there's a lot of slaves in Egypt at this time period. It's not too much to think that some of them went away, right? That's not too much of a stretch of the imagination. It's pretty plausible, especially in light of what the Bible says. At the same time, we have some pretty clear Egyptian influence uh, in the biblical text. Uh, this occurs in a lot of places. Some scholars point to the Ark of the Covenant as uh, examples of Egyptian influence. Uh, but a really good, interesting place is the uh, influence present within the vocabulary of the Hebrews. Uh, this is in a lot of their words, but also it's present in the names of the Levites and only the Levites, because the Levites and only the Levites have Egyptian names. So if a guy has the name Scotty McDonaldson, 
Where is he from? He's a yeah, Sc Scotland's the correct answer, right? He, he is not from the Middle East, is what you can say. Yeah. Oh, I didn't say oh. No, no, no. You, you said what? Kentucky? Nothing, nothing. Right. Continue. Well, anyway, you can make a generalization about where Scotty McDonaldson is from. <laughs> S same thing if a guy has the name of Moses or Hophni or Phineas. Those are Egyptian names. Uh, and so it's really interesting that all the Levites have Egyptian names. Just something to consider. We shouldn't make too much of the evidence, but it does point in the direction of, okay, yeah, we have influence of Egypt within the text of the Bible. So that counts for something. So those are our two lines of circumstantial evidence. And this will wrap us up. So there was a lot of material there. Um, kind of, we flew through that a little bit more than I would like to. But the key takeaways is the Exodus is really important, right? We need it for Israel, for Christians. But we don't have direct archaeological evidence. So no evidence of mass migration, no evidence of uh, chariot wheels in the Red Sea. But we do have the Bible. And the Hebrew text make it pretty clear that the Exodus is this cultural myth, and it functions, it has cultural memory of the Exodus. And so this points to the fact that there's probably some underlying event there. Also, the Exodus story, when properly interpreted, when we take out all the weird number nonsense, it's plausible within the known cultural and the known social context of the time. So it makes sense. So on the basis of these reasons, I think it's pretty reasonable to conclude that an Exodus probably happened. Um, again, you'll notice that I'm being not super committal there, but uh, I think it's very reasonable to assume this because in light of the cultural memory and the circumstantial evidence, it would explain a lot of data points. And I don't think we should be too concerned with the minimalist scholars and their insistence that the Exodus didn't happen. So that is what I have for y'all. Sorry for flying through the ending. Any quick questions before we have to head out to the fishbowl? Katie. Right. Good, interesting point. We're going to have to get out because they're going to kick us out. So thank you all for coming. Uh, hopefully this was informative. And I'll be out in the fishbowl.